أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال فمن ربكما يا موسى قال ربنا الذي أعطى كل شيء خلقه ثم هدى قال فما بال القرون الأولى قال علمها عند ربي في كتاب لا يضل ربي ولا ينسى الذي جعل لكم الأرض مهدا وسلك لكم فيها سبلا وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا به أزواجا من نبات شتى كلوا وارعوا أنعامكم إن في ذلك لآيات لأولنها منها خلقناكم وفيها نعيدكم ومنها نخرجكم تارة أخرى بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا we're continuing on with the story of Musa alayhi salam and the dialogue of Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam with Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, quoting this dialogue, and we stopped off at where Fir'aun began to speak. Qala faman rabbukuma ya Musa. He said, who happens to be your Lord, O Musa alayhi salam? Man rabbukuma, who happens to be your and Harun's Lord, okay? So as soon as he starts his end of the dialogue, his end of the conversation, you'll notice that immediately he's expressing and alluding to his disbelief in everything that Musa alayhi salam had said. Musa alayhi salam had told him and also Harun alayhi salam had told him to submit to the fact that they happened to be messengers and to let go of Banu Israel, who he used to, the Israelites, who he used to chastise and punish and so on and so forth. And that if he were to not do this, then what would happen? Inna qad uhiya ilayna. Anna al-adhaba ala man kathaba wa tawalla. We have been given the wahi, we have been given the revelation that the adhab, the punishment will be upon the person who belies, denies, and also turns away as well. So now, he does exactly what they told him not to do. So then obviously the punishment will be coming in his direction, right? He starts off by saying, فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا If I'm not your Lord, because he used to say, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى I am your greater Lord. That's what he used to say. So now, what did he say? Instead of referring to Lord, to Allah, to the Supreme uh, Being, he referred to, instead of referring to Him as Allah, without any reference to who's Allah he happens to be or who's Lord he happens to be, he does it this way. He says, who's your Lord, O Musa and Harun? I, he's not my Lord, he's simply yours, not mine, right? And that's, that's alluding to disbelief right there. فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى O Musa قَالَ رَبُّنَا Now, Musa is speaking on behalf of Harun as well, He says, قَالَ رَبُّنَا our Lord, and in addition to that, he wants to flip the script on him as well and say that he's actually your Lord as well, whether you like it or not. You're calling him Rabbukuma, your Lord, Musa and Harun. I'm going to say Rabbuna because he's all of our Lords. He says, Qala Rabbuna alladhi a'ta kulla shay'in khalqahu. And that's the type of resolve that a believer should have, even if people try to, to try to allude to disbelief or try to, you know, cast words that allude to disbelief, a believer should always speak like a believer, right? In writing, in speaking, in speech, and so on and so forth. So Musa alayhi salam is speaking in front of this tyrant who wants to make this speak, speech either abstract or in reference to Musa, Rabbukuma, your Lord, he brings it like this, Rabbuna, he's all of our Lord, right? الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ The one who gave every single person his, his existence, خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى And then he also guided as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave every person their shape. Every single 
thing actually, their shape as well. أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ So when your fingers, you look at them, they're designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your face, if you look at it, it's designed by Allah رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ وَالْجَلَالِ Your eyes, if you look at them, they are designed by Allah azza wa jal. Imagine if the eyes happen to be on the toes, right? Then you won't be able to see a lot of things that you need to see. Secondly, you might end up, you know, knocking into many different things that... Uh, that otherwise may damage your eyes. And last but not least, you're going to be wearing shoes, so you're not going to be able to see as well, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the eyes in the most prime real state, so, you, so to say, so that you can see the best, and so that you, you have the most ability to view, right? You have the largest area to see. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the feet and the toes in the right place, and the hands, and He made the fingers the, you know, movable so that you can actually hold things. Imagine fingers that were just like this. You won't be able to hold things, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ Musa alayhi salam, he says, Allah quotes, that the one, my Lord and your Lord, happens to be the one who gave every single thing its shape. ثُمَّ هَدَى And then he guided people to be able to use these things in the right way. A baby has all the tools that an adult has, yes, a lot weaker in terms of his existence and body and so forth and strength and ability to stand or sit and so forth, right? But all the same tools. On his own, the baby figures out that I have to move like this and this is what's going to happen. And if I move like that, this is what's going to happen. And if I walk like this, this is what's going to happen. All these tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, the baby figures it out on his own. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ هَدَى He gave the tools and then He gave us the ability to figure out how to use those tools as well. He gave us fire, he, he taught us how to use the fire. He gave us rides and mounts and so on and so forth. He ta taught us how to use those mounts as well. So Allah gave us all the tools, Allah perfected those tools, Allah shaped those tools, and then Allah gave us the ability to use them as well and taught us how, how best this particular object can be used. فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى Now, Fir'aun continues, قَالْ He says, فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى He says, that, then what about all of the previous generations? You say that this Lord that you speak of is actually your Lord. That's what you say, right? You say that this Lord that you speak of, He's the one who gave us all of this that we have, and He's my Lord, He's your Lord, all of our Lords. But there were people in previous generations as well that, who used to worship idols and so on and so forth. They were the people of who? They were the people of several other messengers as well. What about all of them? What were they doing? They were worshipping idols and they were worshipping human beings and they were worshipping all of these different things. So Musa alayhi salam doesn't want the conversation to go that, down that direction. But he says, look at this. Qal, he says, and that's a very, very important point to have as well. Sometimes what happens is when you're trying to give da'wah to someone, you're calling someone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they end up trying to change the... Uh, the mode of the discussion, or they end up trying to change the conversation to whatever they think is going to be helping their case. A believer is the one who directs the conversation because he's so confident about what he's saying. So Musa alayhi salam, he addresses him very slightly, but he brings it to something else, right? He addresses him very briefly. What about all those generations that came before? Now he could sit there and say, no, 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 hang on. You're mistaken. Adam alayhi salam was a Muslim and he used to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nuh alayhi salam, and the generations that came in middle, in the middle, there were many generations who happened to be Muslims. But remember Nuh alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the punishment upon them and the evidence of this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. He didn't allow him room to steer the conversation in a different direction. He said, All of those nations, the knowledge of them happens to be by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fi kitab in a book. Allah has already written everything down. What's more important is let's talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not get lost or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these things don't end up becoming hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَنْسَى And nor does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forget as well, right? So وَلَا يَنْسَى Allah does not forget. You know, some people, they are ignorant, so they end up establishing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the attribute of forgetfulness. Because Allah says in the Qur'an, نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَنَسِيَهُمْ They forgot Allah, so Allah... Now in English, they might end up translating this as Allah forgot them. But that's not what it necessarily means. 
this is basically mushakala. It's a Arabic rhetorical instrument to use the same verb and really mean something else. Okay? And the proof for that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger saying, La yadillu rabbi wa la yansa. Allah does not get Allah does not subhanahu wa ta'ala get misguided or things don't end up losing away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or being hidden away from Allah. Wa la yansa, nor does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forget. Wama kana rabbuka nasiya, nor is your Lord forgetful. Allah does not forget. So now Allah's Messenger Musa is talking about what? Allah Azza wa Jal. He wanted to steer the conversation in another direction. It happens still today, right? Sometimes you're talking to someone about Islam, they'll talk to you about hijab. When you're done with hijab, they'll take you, take you to another thing. They'll take you, Islam is a religion of terrorism, right? When you're done with that, then they'll, and you give all the evidences and all proofs and everything else, then they'll take you to a third thing, and then a fourth thing, and a fifth thing. And then when they're done with all of those things, they'll come back to the first one again, right? So they'll go in these circles to try to prove really nothing because they're not planning on believing. A believer knows how to steer the conversation on his own. He quickly answered him very slightly, and then he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the more important discussion over here. The one who made for you the earth a, a bed. But before we even get into this verse, let's go back to the previous one as well. Again. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qala ilmuha inda rabbi fi kitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoting Musa alayhi salam, he tells us that the Prophet Musa said, the knowledge of the question that you're asking, the nations that you're asking about, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already has that knowledge recorded in a book, right? Now what that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the evil ones and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the good ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the pious ones, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who did evil deeds as well. All of them are known to Allah azza wa jal. And all of them happen to be in a book. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have to place this information in a book. This is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite knowledge, which is without bounds. But Allah placed it in a book to allude to a fact and to teach us a lesson. Before I even get to that lesson, let's go to another lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Allah created the heavens and the earth in seven days, right? Now, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to take the seven days? No. Because we have in the Quran, Allah says, Kun fayakun. Be and it will be. So as soon as Allah says be, everything else, be, everything becomes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said be and everything would have been. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it in that way so we understand how to persevere and how to be patient. And how everything, for in, in order for us to bring it to fruition, it takes some time. Okay, so sometimes Allah does things in a certain way to teach us not that He is in need of it. Similarly, over here, there is no need for a book because it will always be saved in Allah's infinite knowledge. But Allah places a book to teach us that in order for us to record information, Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us a lesson to write it down, right? And that's why someone came to Qatada and they said, should we rock, write down knowledge? He said, of course, you, of course you should. And then he quoted this verse over here. Ilmuha inda rabbi fi kitab. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placing it in a book as well so that it may be recorded and the record may be preserved and saved as well. Allah continues in the next verse and says, Alladhi ja'ala lakumul arda ma'dan. Musa alayhi salam is now expanding on the powers of Allah, the abilities of Allah, not being driven by the conversation of Fir'aun. Ja'ala lakumul arda ma'dan. The one who made for you the earth a mahad, a plain, a bed, and so on and so forth. Now it's very, very chronological, the thought process of, of uh, Musa alayhi salam, the way he puts this. It's a very, very orderly fashion that he's, quote, he's mentioning the different blessings of Allah. Most likely the person who's, who's uh, going to be reading this is going to be within their house as well, right? Most likely as they're having the conversation, Musa, and Fir'aun, they're in a place which happens to be a plain, which happens to be a bed, which happens to be something upon which people can be resting. A mahad, which literally means a bed, but it means a resting place, a plain place, right? So Allah's Messenger, Musa, starts off with the plain, firstly, that Allah has made within the earth plains for you to be in. And basically, right now, we're in a plain, we're in flat land. Similarly, uh, right now, as you're listening, likely you're on flat land as well, right? Unless you're listening to in, in a, listening to this in a car, then perhaps you're going to be in the next one. 
Allah's Messenger continues and He says, وَسَلَكَ لَكُمْ فِيهَا سُبُولًا And Allah paved for you within this earth streets as well, and paths as well, pathways as well, and roads and so forth. So as soon as you think about this verse, you are essentially in a mahd, you're essentially in a bed, you're essentially in a plain, you're essentially in flat land. And from that flat land, you will go out of your door, you'll go out of your house, and now you'll be on the road. وَسَلَكَ لَكُمْ فِيهَا سُبُولًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for you these streets as well within this, within this world, okay? Now, one may say, no, the streets are paved by us. No, that, is, that may be the case, but Allah allowed for the land to be paved, that's one thing. Number two, there are also naturally paved pathways by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even within mountains as well. وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى And Allah then wants, now that He's already spoken about flat land and plains and streets, and it, it could all be mountainous, the whole world. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about all these things, right? Or Musa alayhi salam spoke about all these things. Then He goes to another thing. He says, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And He re- sent down for you from the heavens water. فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the tone of the conversation, changes the rhetoric of the conversation, and this is what they call iltifat, when you go from one tense to another tense. When you go from the third person to the second person, or the first person, right? So over here essentially it was the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was being spoken of by Musa alayhi salam in the third person and then suddenly the conversation took another course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sort of jumped into the conversation and spoke on his own, right? This is called iltifat. This particular fact always has some sort of rhetorical benefit within it, some sort of eloquent, beautiful benefit within it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it came to the one blessing without which people cannot live, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the first tense, the royal we, because whenever we talk about the, the, the fruits and vegetables and, and nutrition and so on and so forth, that is very personal to people, right? Without nabat, without plants, you can't live. So the other thing, and, and that's something directly related to you, right? The other things you may say, well, no, no, the roads, well, no, the earth, the other planets as well, and this and that and the other. Let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops sending down rain, there's droughts, people will die, animals will die, everyone will die. Okay? There won't be plants. If there's no plants, there won't be animals because they have nothing to graze on. If there are no animals nor, no, nor plants, people don't have food to eat anymore, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the tense of this because the... Because the blessing within this particular factor is directly related to our day-to-day life. Perhaps right after this, you're going to go and have some food or you're going to go make iftar or so on and so forth. And there will be some vegetation there. There will be some animals that, you, that, that grazed as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the tents and shows you that this royalty, Allah azza wa jal, He's the one who grants all of these vegetables. He's the one who grants all of these fruits. فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى So we use this water to allow the land to grow أزواج and many types of what? Of vegetables and fruits and nabat and plants and so on and so forth. شَتَّى which means a variety, right? كُلُوا وَرْعَوْا أَنْعَامَكُمْ So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also encouraging for us to eat vegetables and plants. كُلُوا وَرْعَوْا أَنْعَامَكُمْ Go ahead and eat. وَرْعَوْ أَنْعَامَكُمْ And also graze your animals as well, right? And in reality, though some people today, they believe somehow that, that eating animals is part and parcel of our... Without this, we can't really exist, right? Some people have this idea. And on the other hand, another group of people have the idea that vegetables is the only thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made both of them halal for me. And Allah has encouraged both of these in the Qur'an as well, right? But the only thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discouraged is that we do israf. Kulu wa sharabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink and do not become very, very uh, exhaustive. And do not become very, very uh, extravagant, right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden from is extravagance in eating and drinking. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to eat from, 
from halal animals as well, all the cattle and so on and so forth, and other animals as well. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to eat uh, vegetables as well. And it was, in fact, it is in fact a fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't regularly consume meats. And it is also a fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in some ahadith, he taught us that that the red meat can have actually some damaging effects, especially if it's taken in a large, large quantity as well. So when we're talking about food, we can eat anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because nowadays there's a lot of gossip and discussion about whether we have to all become vegetarians or and that, whether that's the sunnah or whether we all have to stop uh, you know, eating uh, whether we, we just have to continue eating meat because that's the sunnah because there's Eid al-Adha and there's Aqiqa and all of these other uh, celebrations and, and, and festivals and occasions in which we slaughter animals, right? So which one is it? Is this the sunnah or that the sunnah? In reality, the Prophet ﷺ used to eat from both. It's even found within some traditions that the Prophet ﷺ would use would eat something that the fire hadn't touched. What that means is that he would pretty much eat raw vegetables or so on and so forth at the time of his uh, at the time at which he would break his fast if he didn't find the the dates the moist dates the dry dates the water then he would go for something that happens to be raw that is found with, within the sunnah even though the hadith happens to be weak nonetheless what we have established from the sunnah is the prophet ﷺ would eat everything and that he wouldn't fill his stomach up with meat uh, definitely not and that it wasn't definitely a regular thing that was available to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what we have within the Qur'an is that we can eat everything so long as we're not extravagant. And this particular ayah definitely is encouraging the eating of, uh, of vegetables. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى Allah has created from this water, Allah has taken out from this water, azwaj and pears from many, many different types of plants, right? So eat from that and also graze your animals therein as well. And one of the benefits of this, by the way, is that plants is actually a source from which you can get a lot more minerals than animals because minerals are found within the ground and plants sort of take those minerals and that can, it's easier for the minerals to transfer into the body as opposed to animals grazing then taking those minerals, and then you eating the meat, which decreases the possibility of, uh, of you receiving the ample amount of minerals needed for your existence. From the earth have we created you. And within the earth shall we return you back. And from the earth will we return وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَىٰ And from the earth will we take you out uh, yet again, okay? This particular ayah, there is a hadith found in the authentic traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the authority of Al-Bara' ibn Azib that when this angel of death comes and takes the soul out, the soul is then taken and it's ascended with, the angel ascends with the soul to the heavens. So when he gets to the first heaven, or as he's passing, if he sees an assembly of angels, the angels, they look at the soul, if it's a beautiful soul, and then they say that what happens to be that beautiful, who is that beautiful soul? Or whose soul is that beautiful and, and uh, great soul of, that pure soul of? So the angel of death, now this is of course if, this soul happens to be beautiful. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us pure and beautiful souls. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So the assembly of the angels, they say, that whose beautiful and pure soul is that? Ma hadihi ruh tayyibah What is this beautiful soul? So the angel of death who's carrying the soul, he says, this is the soul of Fulan ibn Fulan, such and such individual. And at that moment, he mentions the best of the names of this specific person, okay? Because remember, in the dunya, sometimes people have several names. Some of those names are beautiful and people, uh, very, very uh, enjoyable names. And some names people themselves do not like to be called by. But some people, you know, to annoy other people, they use those names of them as well. Angels will not do that. They will use the best of the names for the people who believe in Allah as they're ascending with their souls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So then they go to the first heavens and then they're allowed and permitted to continue. Then they go to the second and they're allowed to per, 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 and permitted to continue and so on and so forth until they get to the seventh heaven. And in the seventh heaven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command these angels to take the soul and write the name of the soul in a book, in a letter, which will be a record of all of those souls which happen to be the most elite and the best of souls. Those who happen to be from Al-Illiyyin, those who happen to be amidst the people who, who can be rewarded this title of being among the Illiyyin, the ones that are the elite and the best and the, and the most supreme amongst mankind. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amidst those. And at that moment, after they're written into the Illiyin, those who happen to be the utmost best, basically. Okay? Al Illiyin is a plural word which simply means those who those who are placed in a station which is high and even above that and even above that. Meaning that it, it has no ends to its height. It has no end to its heights. That's what that means. Alright? So these are literally the highest people within the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their names are placed within the Al-Illiyin. Now some said that Al-Illiyin or Al-Illiyun is actually referring to the seventh heaven itself. And others they said that it is referring to a, it is referring to the leg of the Arsh of Allah Azza wa Jal. The throne of Allah Azza wa Jal, the right leg of it, the right carrier of it if you so please, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have that particular name placed by that area of the arsh. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amidst those people whose name, names are placed in such a high station. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in this particular hadith as well, which is authentic as I said, that I have created them from it. Return him back to the earth. For verily I have created them from it and I will return them back to it, and I will take them out, resurrect them on the Day of Judgment from it as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amidst the Illiyin, amidst the people whose names are placed in the scroll of the Illiyin. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.